one of the most important chapters, I guess, one of the most blessed in our Bible is the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 22, and uh, I want to begin reading with verse number 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abram, uh, Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning, and saddled his ass, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which the Lord, or which God, had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted up his eyes, and he saw the place uh, far off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship, and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went to both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And perhaps this is one of the greatest verses in all the Bible. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering, so that they both went, uh, uh, and so they both uh, of them together. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place of which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar and laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead or in the place of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. And if you will, uh, notice in verse 15, 16, 17, the Abrahamic covenant is again confirmed unto Abraham, down through verse number 18. And the first part of verse number 19 says, So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. I want to talk to you for just a moment with this thought in mind, the divine side of Calvary, the divine side of Calvary. Now we know, of course, Calvary is where our Lord Jesus died for your sin debt and for mine. But here way back in the book of Genesis, we have a foreshadowing, a type, if you will, of that event that would one day play out in the city of Jerusalem where Jesus would be crucified. I think in this particular text of Scripture, Abraham is portrayed as God the Father. Of course, Isaac represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this chapter, I think we see into the mind of God a glimpse of what God had in mind since before the foundation of the world. That one, I believe that God, before he ever made a man and put him in the world, and before that man ever sinned, I believe God knew that the man would sin, and he had already provided the fact that one day he would send his son into the world to die for that man. God did all of that before it ever came to pass. 
And so that is a big subject, and I only have time to mention it briefly, and I will cover this scripture very lightly this morning. But I hope to bring out two or three truths that may be a blessing to you. The divine side of Calvary. How does God look at Calvary and what transpired there when Jesus died for you and I? When I was a little boy, my mother used to read us from the uh, Bible every night. And I remembered as she would read through the Gospels and especially leading up to the crucifixion of Christ, which she often read to us. I remember as a little old boy feeling that it was not right the way that they did the Lord Jesus. She talked about all of his miracles and how he loved us and all as she would read the Bible. That's what she put into our heads that, you know, Jesus loves you and everything that he did just seemed to be perfect. And the crowds came and the folks that he healed and the folks that he touched had compassion on him. And uh, I remember as going up to the cross, it seemed like those who were his earthly friends began to just fall away. And finally, when he stood in Pilate's judgment hall, there was no man that would speak up. And as they led him out of the city of Jerusalem to the hillside called Calvary, there was nobody that tried to interrupt or intervene on the road to where our Lord would be crucified. Even around the cross, they came by, the crowds did, and they cursed and mocked him. And I always wondered as a little child, why, why didn't somebody stand up for our Lord? Why didn't somebody say that you cannot do this? This is the Son of God. I was always a little bit angered by that, even as a little child. But you know, the older that I get and the more I realize there was something more than just a just man going to the gallows when Jesus hung on the cross of Calvary. We know there's a spiritual part of it. Matter of fact, he was going to pay our sin debt. God demanded that that payment for sin be paid. And, uh, you know, he said to his disciples, I have presently 12 legions of angels that I could call and they would come and they would deliver me from the cross. But Jesus didn't call the 12 legion of angels. He went and willingly laid down his life for you and I. There was a divine transaction going on on Calvary's cross when our Lord was crucified. And so here in this particular text, I think we can understand uh, some of what was going on uh, between uh, Abraham and Isaac that represents a spiritual greater truth that happened when our Lord died at Calvary. The Bible says in verse number 1, And it came to pass after these things. And that primarily is a reference to the birth of Isaac, which takes place in chapter 21. You know, Isaac was a miracle child. He was born when Abraham and Sarah both were too old to either father or to have a child. But it was a miraculous birth, and in that, he represents our Lord. I want to tell you that our Lord had a miraculous birth. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit of God, and Mary was a virgin, and that doesn't just happen on its own. It was miraculous from beginning to end. And so after these things, and if you study the life of Abraham going all the way back to chapter number 12, there was several great trials in Abraham's life. He had the time where God spoke to him, and he said, I tell you what I want you to do. I want you to leave your country. That would have been a trial to endure. And you know, faith is an ever-growing thing. We never arrive totally at perfection. And of course, Abraham hadn't either in his life. And so God appears to him again here and says, Now, after all these things, after what you've been through, and uh, you know, here is going to be the greatest trial that Abraham would ever face. Would he obey God? Would he ask him to take the life of his own son? We know God doesn't ask us necessarily all the time to do big things all at once. But in our Christian life, there are a series of trials that God often puts us through to train us, to test us, and to help us grow. First of all, God said, I want you to get out of your country. Leave familiar surroundings. And of course, Abraham eventually left his country, and he was successful in that test. The next test came with Abraham's family. He said, I want you to separate from your family. And of course, his father passed away. But Lot, the nephew, the carnal, carnal believer named Lot, 
he was still hanging on to Abraham, and Abraham just couldn't get rid of him. So finally, God took care of that problem, and God separated him. And so eventually, Abraham obeyed in that. And then, of course, we come here to this temptation, uh, this trial, if you will. The Bible says that God did tempt him. Now, we know that God does not tempt people to do evil or to do wrong. The word for tempt there is the word try or a trial. God did try Abraham, tried his faith. He said unto him, Abraham, he said, behold, here I am. And he said, now take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. So Abraham here now steps up to the greatest test of his faith. And God said, I want you to take your son, thine only son. Was this Abraham's only son? No. He had another son by the Egyptian uh, handmaid. Her name was Hagar. And that child's name was Ishmael. But Ishmael represents the works of the flesh. He is a type of the flesh from beginning to ending. And God never recognizes the flesh. He never recognizes the works that men may do. That it's not acceptable in his sight. But now Isaac, he's his only son. He is the spiritual seed through which our Lord would ultimately come into the earth. He said, I want you to take thine only son, Isaac. Notice this, whom thou lovest. And you folks that are fathers or mothers, you can understand the love that you have for your children. There is nothing like it in all the world. You would gladly sacrifice your life for theirs at any time. If you want to fight on your hands, you mess with a a lion, you mess with her little cubs, or take an old bear, she'll cut your head off. If you mess with those little cubs that she has, that's motherly instinct. And it's in the father's instinct. If there's anything to him, if he's much of a man, he'll fight you over his kids, uh, and well, it should be, right? So here he says, now I want you to take your son, your only son, whom thou lovest. Now I want to say a word about that. Lovest. Even as human beings, we don't have a perfect love. But you think about Abraham represents God the Father. And Isaac represents the Son. There was a love relationship between Father and Son that is inseparable. And you know, oftentimes we think that, well, uh, God must not have loved His Son if He judged Him onto the cross. But I assure you that He did love Him, and there was no space between them. They were in perfect harmony and fellowship forever. So there's the love. He said, get thee into the land of Moriah. And uh, Moriah means the Lord will provide. And offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, Abraham's well acquainted with giving offerings to God and the burnt offering. His son was to be slayed and his body would be burned in this burnt offering. And notice what Abraham does in verse number 3. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. So here we are, four days prior to Isaac's arrival on Mount Moriah, four days. Now, Abraham has revealed this probably in the evening before. So Abraham has this in his mind for four days that he's going to have to, on the fourth day, offer his son. You know, I find that rather significant. You know, when they offered a lamb, the Passover lamb in the Old Testament, they would put that lamb up. And they would observe that lamb to make sure that he was perfect and there was no blemish in him four days prior to him becoming the Passover lamb. And so four days before Isaac is to be slain, Abraham has it in his mind that this is going to happen on that fourth day. You think about this. You know, the Bible says that a day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. From the time that Adam was created and placed in the Garden of Eden and eventually fell into sin to the arrival of Jesus Christ on the scene, that is 4,000 years. 
or four millennial days before the Lord Jesus would arrive to become the sacrifice for our sins. I want to tell you something. In everything that God does, His timing is always perfect. So, He said, now you get up to the land of Moriah and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now, let me say just a word about the mountain, and I may not get back there. We know that it's in the mountain range of Moriah. By the way, Jerusalem was not a city at that time. But the very mountain on which uh, Isaac was offered by Abraham would one day become the very mountain upon which our Lord would be crucified. Now I find that amazing. God's saying there's something about that mountain that is the place for sacrifice and he points it out. Matter of fact, he says in verse number 4 that Abraham saw not just a place, but the place, the appointed place where God said that Isaac would die. Now, let's get back to verse number 3. So Abraham rose up early in the morning without delay, early to get about the business and the work that God had told him of. I don't know about you, but I think of it as a natural father. God appears to you late one evening. And says, now, in four days, I want you to offer your son. I expect that I would have spent that night walking the floors. God's asked him to do the hardest thing that he'd ever asked him to do in all of his life. Offer your son. Maybe he didn't sleep any that night. But Abraham seems to be very confident. And I think by reading other scriptures that I can say that Abraham probably rested on that night. And awoke and rose early to get about the work of the Lord. Verse number 3. Saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. Now let me say just a word about those two young men that go with him. They travel out with them to a certain place. And Abraham stops. And he says, now you two young fellows, y'all just stay here. But me and the lad are going to go up into the mountain and we're going to worship and we're going to come back to you again. But they were accompanied to that place by these two young men. You know, when our Lord was crucified, there were two others that was with Him as well. There was the repentant thief and the unrepentant thief who hung with our Lord on the cross. Two young men. Maybe I won't have time to say any more about that, but I'm trying to say enough about this this morning that you can get far enough down the road where you can see that uh, God had something in mind when He allowed the Lord Jesus to come. So Abraham rose up early, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, he claved the wood or took the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, you ever notice the significance of the third day in the Bible? It's important to God, isn't it? On the third day, our Lord arose from the grave. Third day. Abraham lifted up his eyes, saw that place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, you stay here with the ass and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Now here is a broad statement of Abraham's faith. He says to them, you are in the mouth of two or three witnesses as every word established. He said, y'all just stay here, but I and the lad are going to go yonder. And notice this, come again to you. Let me read uh, some scripture to you if you don't mind. In, uh, well, let me get over here to the book of Hebrews. Let's see what the Bible says there. Hebrews 11 and verse 17. By faith, by faith, Abraham, who represents the father, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he had received the promises uh, offered up. 
His only begotten Son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, you remember that when God spoke to Abraham, all of his future promises depended upon Isaac and his seed. Eventually, the seed of the woman would be the Lord Jesus. But everything that God had dealt with Abraham with up until this time had to do with Isaac. The only son that God recognized, that special gifted son to Abraham. It all depended on him that he had to live and, of course, have children of his own. And by the way, Abraham is not a little bitty boy when this all happens. Uh, Isaac is a grown man above 18 years old when it happens of what I've just read to you in Genesis 22. But notice it says in the book of Hebrews chapter 11 and uh, verse number 19, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, listen to this, from whence also he received him in a figure. Now you know what that verse is telling us? That we don't read here in Genesis chapter 22 per se, when God came down to Abraham, he said, I want you to take your son up there and offer him as a burnt sacrifice. Abraham knew that that meant taking the life of his son, but everything depended upon the son. So what would happen? God, Abraham had this thought that if God asked me to take his life, then God will raise him from the dead if I do. So actually, Abraham sees the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He saw it in his son. Matter of fact, let me read this verse of Scripture to you, if I can find it rather quickly, in the book of Galatians. And it's found in chapter number 3. It says this in chapter 3 and verse number 7, or 6, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Listen to verse 8. And the scripture, foreseeing or looking down through the future times, the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Did you know that... What Abraham saw was the gospel. Now, what is the gospel? The gospel is the good news of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. And so Abraham looks down through time, and he has the gospel of Christ preached in his own son, accounting that if he took his life, God was able to raise him from the dead. I don't know about you, but that's a big truth for that far back in the Old Testament that there would be such a thing as a resurrection from the dead. But that's exactly what Abraham saw. So I have the idea that maybe Abraham rested well the night before he takes his son out. He is about to witness the greatest thing that it could ever be, that if he takes his life, God will raise him from the dead. Can you imagine? He must have been excited about the whole thing. And notice, if you will, he says to those young men in verse number 5, I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again. I and the lad. In other words, this is going to be something that they're not going to be witness to, but this is going to be a divine transaction that takes place between Abraham and his son. And did you know that's exactly what Jesus did at Calvary? There was a divine transaction that took place between God the Father and God the Son. As Jesus went into the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, he told his disciples, said, watch with me and pray. And he took them so far in the garden and they stopped. Peter, James, and John went a little farther. But then Jesus went about a stone's throw, even beyond them. And alone he bowed on his knees in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't think the cup there was death. I think the cup was him becoming sin. 
And he knew that if he became sin, that, that all that fellowship that they'd had in eternity past, that it would be terminated at that point. And he prayed that prayer three times. And he came back and checked on the disciples. And they'd went to sleep. And it seems like that Jesus steps away from all of his friendships and all of his family ties. And Jesus seems to me to be a very lonely man as he walks out of the garden to Gethsemane and is met with that crowd where he's arrested and with brutality taken and given a mock trial. And I can see now that what I couldn't see when I was young was that there was nothing that could be said. There, there was no human that could intervene. It was now not between him and the Jews who they crucified him. But you remember that passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 2, verse 22 and 23. It says this, Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. And he said that Christ was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God knew what would happen to his son. But there came a day that he was arrested and the Jews consented to his death. But there was more than just the Jews involved. There was a divine side of it. And there, as Jesus hung on the cross, he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And there it was, I think, that God turned his back on his son. And from 12 o'clock noon or to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, as our Lord hung on the cross, there was darkness over the face of the earth. There was something going on behind the scenes that could not be seen by human eyes or understood by human minds that God was deserting and leaving His Son because He was the sacrifice for our sins. That was a divine transaction that was happening between Father and between Son. The sights of the cross and the crucifixion was so strong that even the earth quaked and it shook because its creator had bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The divine side of Calvary. But the hope was, I and the lad will go yonder and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood and the burnt offering, laid it on his son. As our Lord bore his own cross to be crucified. Here Isaac bears the wood that would be part of the sacrifice. In every single way, he is a type of God the Son. Notice, if you will, in verse number 6, it says that he laid the wood on his son. But Abraham took the fire in his hand, and Abraham took the knife in his hand. That fire represents divine judgment. And when Jesus died at the cross of Calvary, divine wrath and divine judgment against Old Testament sins, against New Testament sins, and against our future sins was to be poured out upon the Lord Jesus as he hung there. The fire was in the hand of the Father. Much I could say about that. Remember when Adam sinned, God tossed him out of the Garden of Eden, said you can't go back in. The Bible said he put a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the entrance to the, tree, uh, to, uh, to the garden to keep man away from the tree of life. That was a fiery sword that did that. And here he has the fire. He has the knife by which he would take our Lord's uh, or Isaac's life. And so it was that on the cross of Calvary, it wasn't the crucifixion that killed Christ. It wasn't the spear thrust into his side for he was already dead at that point. It wasn't the crown of thorns that was beaten into his head. It wasn't the nails in his hands or his feet that killed our Lord. On the cross of Calvary, our Lord voluntarily dismissed the Spirit from His body on the cross as a sacrifice to God. And so they go up, and we know that story well. Uh, verse 8, Abraham said, My son, God will provide Himself a lamb for a burnt offering. Dr. Harold Seitler, who is one of my great heroes, uh, said that he had preached on this text many times. I haven't personally preached on this text many times, sometimes, but not many. But Seitler, uh, in his younger ministry, preached many times out of Genesis 22. and said, 
he got up and read the scripture one night in a meeting, and this is what he said. Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself a lamb. And he preached on that. He said after the service, a young man, a young preacher in the service came to him and said, Dr. Seitler, very respectfully, sir, you read the text wrong. Dr. Seitler said, no, sir, I do not believe that I did. And the young man said, yes, sir, and opened his Bible to verse number 8. And he read, my son, God will provide not for himself, but himself, himself a lamb. Makes a big difference, doesn't it? Himself. You know what God required in a sacrifice was perfection. And what God demanded for a payment of sin, only God could provide. And the only way God could provide that sacrifice was allow His Son to come into the world and to be born and to die at Calvary. And so it was. The Lord provided Him very self as the Lamb. And so it happened at Calvary. Boy, that's a good truth, isn't it? Much, much I could say about that. I see Isaac in verse number 9. There he was, laid on the wood, and he was bound there. He was bound there. I've often wondered if our Lord could have changed his mind about going to the cross. That Isaac offered no resistance whatsoever. As it becomes evident to him, he's a grown man, he's over 18 years old. And Isaac's already, he was old when Isaac was born. So he's over 100 years old now. And I don't know how you are at 100, but I can promise you one thing, it wouldn't take very much to knock me over at 63. <laughs> well, Isaac very well could have said, old man, Listen, <laughs> we're not doing this. You're not going for me. But Isaac, in complete obedience to the father, said, Dad, said, if that's what God said for you to do, you do it. I want to say this from eternity past. Somewhere God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost sat down and determined our plan of salvation. And I believe way back yonder, Jesus volunteered and said, Father, I'll go. If it means death, I'll go, and I'll pay the price. He said this, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, and it is written of me to do thy will, O God. And Jesus, as a lamb before her shearers is dumb, went to the cross and willingly laid down his life because that was a plan that was made, and I'm not going to read the scripture, but First Peter chapter 1 and verse number 20, from the foundation of the world, that was God's plan. There was a divine side to Calvary that had to take place. All people separated from Him as our Lord went to the cross as to offer Him no human aid or no human assistance. Only he could go to the cross. Only he could pay the sin debt. I would say to my younger self as a little boy when I heard the story, I would say, little boy, you, you don't understand. There was something going on there between God the Father and God the Son that only God could do. When you try to add your good works or your good behavior to anything that has to do with your salvation, I want to tell you something. You cheapen the gospel. You cheapen the grace of God. Had there been any other way for the sin debt to have been paid other than Jesus dying on the cross, that would have, that would have happened and God would have spared him. But Romans 8 says that God spared not his own son. The holiness of God demanded a sacrifice and a payment to be made. And only the holiness of God could provide that. And he did it in the person of his son. I want to tell you something, folks. We're saved this morning. We're saved by the simple grace of God and nothing else. Don't depend on you to get your way to heaven. 
And Abraham became the father. He became an example of what faith in God would do. Abraham didn't trust any circumcision. He didn't trust in all those things. But he looked down the road and he saw the gospel preached in the person of Jesus Christ. And he put his faith and trust in that. And you know, you and I today, we're counted justified because we put our faith in the same thing Abraham did, don't we? Death, burial, and resurrection of his son. Stand at our feet, please. If I walk in the pathway of beauty And if I work to the close of the day I shall see the great King in His beauty When I've gone the last mile of the way If for Christ I proclaim the glad story And if I seek for his sheep gone astray I am sure he will show me his glory When I've gone the last mile of the way When I've gone the last mile of the way I will rest at the close of the day And I know there are joys that When I've gone the last mile of the way Hear the dearest of ties we must sever Tears of sorrow are seen every day But no sin no sighing forever when I've gone the last mile of the way and if here I have earnestly striven and have tried all his will to obey will enhance all the rapture of heaven when I've gone the last mile of the way when I've gone the last mile of the way I will rest at the close And I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile of the way. And I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile.